Uh, okay. Um, thank you for asking me along. Um, I just want to, uh, when, when I did the, the talk for the Dinghy Cruising Association, which uh, John Wilsford has done as well uh, the year before, um, I ended up preparing too many darn slides. Uh, so this is just going to some of the ones I, I didn't go through, which were more about hull design. Um, but um, with uh, the focus on uh, uh, on the focus with the focus on pleasant handling characteristics. So um, I'll just uh, share screen. Okay, so you should be able to see me in one corner and some slides as I change them. So, so um, that was that's not me. Um, but it's very similar to my first boat, um, bought for $70, the sales were laced on. Um, and um, I got used to sailing and capsizing on pit water. Um, I'm just going to whiz through the background. The next boat, this is thanks to Kim who found the photo. Um, I think it was here, wasn't it, Kim? I think you found yeah, this photo. Yeah, that was the Frisco. Um, uh, Dory, was it? Oh, yeah, Frisco. Yeah, uh, Frisco Dory. Dory the, yeah. the Frisco is a pretty ugly, um, strange little boat. The Frisco Dory is a bit racy. They, um, but it was used as a single hander. So um, I certainly learned how to. Um, I started sailing with some friend, a friend, um, and then. I uh, started sailing single-handed as I got a bit bigger main and jib and added in the trapeze that the adults were using in other centres. Um, then on to NS14s, again, not me. Um, this is um, a 1970 era boat, um, which were, were the boats I was sailing, but um, very sophisticated, very nice. Um, for a period, I didn't do any sailing um, and um, felt very depressed living in the inner city. So I got a tax return for, I think it was $400. So I bought a moth. Um, again, this is not me. This was the world champion. <laughs> Just a file photo I had on my computer. Um, then the next boat um, I spent a lot of time in was the Australian lightweight Sharpie. I do have a link to this one because it's my ex-boss sailing. Um, one of the characteristics of the Sharpie is when you get it really flying along, um, these two great big sheets of spray come off both sides of the boat and nobody except the forward hand can see what's happening. And that's just going upwind. <laughs> so you're asking the forward hand, are we laying the mark yet? Are we laying the mark? And you just getting spray in the face the whole time. But um, they're a great steamboat, um, can handle anything, even if, um, um, as long as you keep them flat, as soon as you let them heal, the weight of the reef just pulls them over. Um, and that, I sailed almost everything else. Um, so I had a really good cross section of, um, of boat types that I'd sell. I'd sell parents, I'd sell mirrors, I'd sell um, uh, Walkers seniors, I'd sell Walkers juniors, I'd sell um, 12 foot skiffs, um, just anything I could get a ride on um, when I was young. Uh, yachts too. Um, and I drew, I was boat obsessed and drew boats on every available piece of paper. Um, and then I swore off um, about when I started going to university. I swore off and said, I, I'm not going to draw another boat on another piece of paper until I build it. And the result of that, um, about seven years later, was this. Um, so the idea was taking the Bolger instant boat idea. Um, uh, of a very of a boxy hull with um, 
with 90 degree giants uh, so that everything can be laid out very easily without any um, accounting for hull twists or anything. Everything's just flat. So you just have to straighten it out on the drafting board. And um, Bob's your, 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 your mother's father, but mother's brother. Um, so, and that ended up being a big exploration because there were a bunch of things I wanted to try on the boat. And one was to see whether the lug rigs could be made to perform okay, balanced lug in particular. Um, also, uh, to see how much sail I could cram on it. Like most cruising canoes of this size and this beam um, would be, would have about um, 65, 70 square feet of sail. So this bed has 82. Um, some of the racing canoes had very much more, even up to 200 square feet um, on um, a 16 or 18 foot hull um, with three masts. But um, my assumption was that we'd learn something in, in the 100 and, um, 120 years since the, um, the, all the photos I'd seen of the American sailing canoes um, that, that era. So I designed beds. Um, there were a couple of, um, oh yeah, let's just, let's have another couple of looks at her. Um, the idea was to take the, the instant boat idea and then make it as elegant as possible by putting a conventional deck on it. Um, yeah. Also, um, it was to see if um, to to see if a yawl could be made to go upwind. You can call it a catch or yawl. Of course, I'm not sure whether it's for for fishing or rowing. Um, the one of the experiments, I'll just another, I think I, I succeeded pretty well in making it elegant. Um, and it ended up being quite a nice performance boat. Um, the original centerboard, or originally it didn't go upwind very well and tacked very poorly, but I added a little bit more to the centerboard, um, about um, about a foot to the centerboard, and it suddenly started behaving very nicely. Um, about equal in club races on the lake with a laser. Um, not one of the really top shot lasers, but a sailor like myself sailing a laser, a sailor like me on a laser versus best that was fairly even. Um, one of the other things I tried was, um, was an absolutely tiny rudder. Um, I can't, can't actually move this around. Um, the rudder is not much deeper than the edge of the photo frame just there. Can you see my cursor? Yes, okay, cool. Um, yeah, because Australia imported one um, e-scow, one of the big American um, lake sailing um, scows, 38 feet, and they had, had two rudders, but they were absolutely tiny. The rudders were that big. Um, what they rely on is that the scow shape is very balanced. It doesn't have any weird handling effects when it's healed. Um, so I thought I'd play with that as well. But I wasn't quite sure what would happen when the boat healed. Now, yeah, so that's um, the sail reefed. Um, in South Australia, there's a lot of countryside like that in the Lower Murray. Um, really great cruising area um, for dinghies. And you don't have to wash the boat off after because it's fresh water. Um, so what I was, because of my dinghy experience, um, I was wondering what the hell would happen to the boat um, when, I, when it was overpowered, because I'd already designed it with a too much sail area. Um, I very rarely reefed it. Um, usually only reefed it when I was um, going somewhere and there was a lot of wind. Uh, going somewhere upwind and there was a lot of wind. Um, yeah. So what I expected was that when the boat healed, I'd get some weather help. You can see how the tiller is pulled to windward a little bit. Um, 
yeah, so the boat is out of the boat is out of balance. Um, and what he needs, he, the sailor needs to do a couple of things to get rid of the helm um, and stop putting the brakes on. Um, normally, it's to ease the sail a little bit and hike it a little bit harder. He can do both. Um, a bit more extreme. Oh, as a tiny image, um, but you, you might be able to see that the tiller is pulled well to windward. Um, and I expected handling that, like these, these are things that a transom stern's, a, a person selling most performance boats with a transom stern expects to happen. Um, let's see if the other one's a bit bigger. Yeah, there's a bit bigger one, right? So really, really sailing with the brakes on and um, on the edge of having enough control to stop the boat from rounding up. Um, if you can't stop the round the boat from rounding up, it gets more exciting, of course. Right? There's sort of a, a terminal aspect to um, uh, to conventional sailing dinghies. Um, part of it is that we sail them in an awful lot of wind sometimes. Um, but Going back to Beth, what I was expecting to happen was that I'd get a super gust and then that tiny little rudder would, the tiny little rudder sub would stall out and the boat would round up or do something crazy. Um, I'm an Australian, I'm used to capsizing, so that's okay. Um, so it was to explore what would happen. And what happened was that um, the rudder stalled out um, because the angle was too great. But the boat just continued straight. There was just no vice at all. The boat would heel, the, the sailing canoe would heel. Um, so, yeah. the, the sailing canoe would heel, um, the rudder would stall, and I'd have no steering, but the boat would just go straight. So that started to be a clue as to how I wanted to design boats. So, so I'm really gathering a lot of data from this first boat I designed. Um, yeah. So, the reasoning I made, the reasoning I, I had about this was that, and it's not unusual reasoning. Um, I've talked to it about John, about it with John Wellsford and um, a long time ago, and um, he was nodding his head and saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a common approach. But the thing that stops boats from being weird when they heal is um, balance volume. If the boat has a lot of volume at the back, um, as it heals, the bow of the boat's going to dig in a bit. And you get to the point where the bow of the boat wants to go one way or another, and the rudder is not enough to hold it. Um, with a boat that is more balanced, and the most obvious and typical one is a canoe um, or a canoe stern boat, um, they've always got a good reputation for good sea keeping. Um, they've always got a reputation for good sea keeping. Um, in older texts, you'll see that it's because they part the waves, the waves come up and they can part the waves. But no, it's, it's actually a volume thing. It's about the volume of the hull. Um, yeah, so let's see what's going to happen here. Um, a few years later, and um, we're on to Oz Geese. Um, you can see the boat is honking along under quite a lot of pressure. Um, it's got Leslie in America. Um, nice rooster tail, bit of water coming out of the centerboard case. Um, but if you try to sail a laser like this, or many normal sailing dinghies, um, they'd be out of control at this point. But you can see the helm, the tiller is actually central. There's no big drama in um, the control of the boat. Let's see what the next one is. Also with the Goat Island skip, um, I started with um, software, um, I can, when I'm drawing up a boat, it's quite easy to check the displacement and prismatic coefficient and things that you want 
to make the boat perform as you expect, but also it's easy to run graphs. And one of the graphs you can run is the pitch down of the boat at the bow as it heals. So with dinghies, I always ran, um, ran through that to about 30 degrees. Um, the Goat Island Skiff was the first boat where I did it being aware of um, what I was doing. Um, so I did a very careful job. It basically means that the stern can't be too wide. Uh, and as soon as you get the wide stern, then um, the volumes go all wrong to the boat heels. Okay, so this is a scow moss. Um, it's a, um, a hull from the 19, the early to mid 1970s. Um, very, very light construction, number of bulkheads, lots of stringers. Um, but the thing to, that I put it here to show is that the stern and bow are just about symmetrical. Um, as you can imagine, the scow in chop, when hard pressed, it's, um, they tend to nose dive. And for years, people tried to adjust what was happening at the bow to stop the nose from digging in. Um, yeah. Okay. But what has to happen, and, um, and what happened with moss, I'll just go back to that previous one. Um, what happened with the moths, that's the bow, of course, um, the stern. What they started doing um, in the late 1970s and early 80s was they started squeezing in the stern a lot more than this, so the stern become quite, became quite narrow. Um, and that solves the bulk of the problems with the boat nose island. It wasn't the bow you had to fix, it was the stern. So having a narrower stern does two things. It means when the crew moves back a bit, it sinks the stern. But also, um, when the boat heals, there's less volume at the back. So um, the bow tends to come up a little bit as it heals as well. So that's the bottom of the Goat Island skiff. Um, it should, you know, like if you were drawing up a, um, the plan view of a boat, the um, Maximum width of the bottom panel is very far back. It's about about there. That's where the maximum width is. Um, maybe a little bit further back. Um, you can really see it on the plants. So I should have put them in. But then I did the moth trick of pinching the stern in um, quite hard. Um, can you see me as well as the image, or just the image? Okay. I can't. See I can't. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so um, as the goat heals, um, it doesn't do anything stupid. Um, the boat, a goat is actually quite a tender boat, but it's got two safety features. One is it's a very, very high-sided boat, so it can heal a long way before the water comes in. But, but the most important one is that even with that large amount of heal, you can still steer it. it. It will actually respond to the helm. Um, so you can actually steer out of the problem. Um, so while, yeah, so that's that. Um, so, so the way that most of us get around that problem is just by just um, going upwind anyhow is our sailing style has really changed. Um, we ease the sails rather than try and last the boat. Um, this is just after I read a book by Frank Bethwaite, um, where he's talking about um, uh, computer simulations, or, or, or sorry, um, um, yeah, um, they've, they've got a, a, a part of a laser and they've got computer screens around. Um, it's got a boom, it's got a main sheet, um, it's got a tiller, um, and all of those inputs are recorded and fed into a analysis program which gives the boat speed and boat position. And, and they were able to find that um, 
sailors sailing the old way of luffing up in gusts were much, much slower um, than people who ease the sail. Um, this has been well known in racing circles for quite a long time. But um, it does also remove the chance, almost totally removes the chance of um, capsizing to windward um, because if the sail is out, the well, gas comes, sail goes out to keep the boat flat, um, gas ends, then you can pull the sail back in again and you prevent yourself from ending up in the water. Um, since I adopted this, I was sort of a past master at doing the luff up and squeezing the sail to get maximum height. Um, and normally I would be in amongst these other geese. Um, but um, I've ended up a long way to windward and a long way ahead on the first try. Um, the boat just behind me is Paul, who um, was a relatively new sailor, and I'd taken him aside before the race and said, hey, look, Paul, I'm trying this, this, trying this. So just keep close and keep the boat flat with the sheet. So Paul is pulling away from the other boats too. We can actually see every time a gasket, they would slide to lure it a bit more. Um, as boats get bigger, it's not so possible to do this. So um, on a bigger yacht, it can be really unwieldy to try and dump the mainsail or main sheet or the traveller. Um, so there you have to pinch the boat. That's the best choice. But for our size of boat, it actually makes a lot of sense. Um, just to keep the boat flat by using the sheet. Um, the other thing is it's really easy to teach. Um, there's a lot of coordination um, required to teach a newcomer to sailing the whole sort of gust hits, ease, point up, wind the mainsail in as much as you can, and then when the gust ends, bear away and hope you don't roll into windward. Um, it's really tricky to teach. But this, this way of just easing the main sheet without changing the angle much or the, without changing direction much is super easy to teach. You can have one person on the main sheet, the other person steering, and the boat is going upwind. It feels really good. They can feel the performance. They can feel the feedback from the boat that it's really happy. Okay, what's the next slide? Okay, so um, this is the viola sailing canoe. Um, basically, with a sailing canoe, it's, it's very hard to design something that has some um, um, bad handling characteristics. Um, what we I did with the, or what we did with the viola, because I was working with Yoast in the Netherlands, um, um, was to have a more dingy shape at the back. So instead of it being symmetrical with, um, you know, quite a bead shape in the front and then V in the back, it's actually very, very flat in the back, which gives a lot more stability. Um, you have to be a bit judicious um, to make it too fat at the back. Um, you get into the same problem as the transom um, stern thing is. Um, yeah. So another view. Um, basically, the idea was to remove everything that could be removed from a small sailing boat and also to appeal to um, cruisers um, like us and um, also to appeal to the racing guides. Um, the structure is very, very minimal and looks terribly good in a, in a living room. Yeah. So in the last few years, it seems I've been directed to sell, you know, it's, it's been my calling to design canoes. Um, the main reason is that um, you can sell them uh, because they're not a lot of materials. Um, you can car, car, car top them, et cetera. They're easy boats to own. So having a canoe format makes a lot of sense to many people. And this is the combi, which is a paddling canoe, a paddling and sail canoe. Um, so it's got bit, a bit more of a canoe entry and the back of the boat is a, still flattened, 
but a bit more like um, a bit more like the um, like a, a, a dinghy, but not as an extreme as the viola. The whole idea was to make it look like a canoe from every angle. Yeah, so getting it on the roof. Um, so if you take the rig out and take the rudder off, it actually just looks like a canoe. Um, if that was the design intention. Okay. Um, now with the goose, um, one thing that happens with the goose, and um, John will know it happens with um, the, the ducks as well, is that when you get them honking, um, pardon the pun, um, the bow will suddenly kick up in the air. And that's because there's a lot of curvature at the back of the hull. And that helps to keep helps to keep the bow out of trouble. The bow on the goose or duck could be a really could be a liability. But if you sail the boat fast, um, including that upwind technique of easing the sail um, when the gusts come rather than trying to point up, it means higher average speeds than it means the bow stays up out of trouble. Um, even if you do stick the bow in at speed, um, I, the GPS clocked me at 18 knots on this day. Um, I don't know whether I believe it, but it was moving along. Um, the other thing is that if it does come down the wave and dig the bow in, um, it doesn't do anything stupid. Um, if it was a laser or NS14 or Sharpie or any pointy nose thingy, the bow would dig in and then the boat would decide which way it was going to go, that way or that way. Um, it, this is one thing about um, sailing performance thingies. If you stick the nose in, you, 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 you're really heading somewhere unpredictable. But with the goose, it sticks its nose in just stay calm, keep steering, um, because if it heals, it won't do anything stupid. Um, so you can just keep steering. Um, as well as um, mono hulls, uh, multi hulls had trouble with the nose sticking in. And they also tried to fix it by manipulating the bow for many years. Ah, oh, this is annoying. Uh, full screen. Okay, that's better. Okay, so you can see there's um, this is the viola. There's a big gust coming. Big gust coming, so something's going to happen. Um, normally the a boat will heal. Um, and um, but cruising dinghy um, uh, designers are generally trying to get nice handling characteristics, and we try to get the bow to rise gently. Um, not in the crazy, to the crazy extent of the goose, but um, something more refined. So the gust is about to hit, the gust hits and the bow pops up. You can see the crew is sitting quite well forward. You know, they're not having to hike out near the back of the boat or anything. The bow just comes up automatically. Um, I learned about this when I designed a plywood um, sailboard. This is not it. This is just a file photo. Um, so what I did was according to, um, this was a, a second sailing boat I designed. Um, second or third, anyway. Um, with normal racing thingies, we're always told that, well, we want a really nice flat run at the back. Um, so I gave it a really nice flat run over the back. The back was V, but it was flat all the way through to um, about um, uh, three feet from the stern, and then it went V. And um, the test pilot who was racing it competitively um, with other race boards at the time, he said that once you got it going fast, um, the bow wouldn't rise. The bow would not come up. So the bow would stay a little bit low. The advantage of getting the bow up is it reduces the weight of surface of the boat. So it's um, good for more performance, but only if the boat is all by. 
Only if the boat will do it by itself. You don't want to cram up the back of the boat to try and lift the bow um, because you just drag the transom. But with uh, race boards, it was the whole hull lifting and lifting a bit more at the front. Um, so um, the pilot, Menno Van Dorn, he routed off the last bit at the bottom and he put in, um, in the last uh, two feet, there was, um, I think it was about 13 millimetres of lift. So it's not actually something you see much of, but it, it's a measure of how subtle amounts can actually have a big effect keeping the front of the boat where you want it. You know, so um, that's where the more moderate idea came from, um, you know, relative, and, and, and that's where um, uh, the, the rocker of Viola came from. Okay, here are a bunch of NS14s from the 1970s. Just let me have a drink of water. Okay, you can see that all of them are quite deep up in the bow. They're very V. And the reason that happens, they're very V and uh, there's a lot more rocker at the front and the boat flattens out at the back. That's what naturally happens. But if you have a boat sitting in the water, you're going to want to have, you want to have the bounds turn, um, relatively speaking, out of the water so they don't dig in too deep. And you've also got to have enough displacement by putting in a curve, right? So if you have the back nice and flat, it forces the front part of the boat to be much deeper. Right, and this is the way we thought about thingies because we wanted to have a, you know, there's been probably two centuries written about um, the long straight, the long straight run aft that makes the boat fast. I agree, but in all things moderation. Okay, so this is an abacore, which was an upper box design thingy. When it starts planing, the bow starts rising, has to rise up quite a lot for it to plane efficiently. Um, this is because with the real V at the front of the boat, good for going through the chop, um, there, there, there's not much um, ability to develop lift at the front of the boat. Um, this is a modern, a fairly modern NS14. And they found that the faster way to get through, um, to design the boat, is to have a flat up the middle of the boat. Um, the reason for this uh, is flat plate theory. Um, the water is coming from this side and it's egg is exiting over here. Um, you'll only get lift if you've got this positive angle of incidence, right? If it's, if it is the other way, if you've got a positive angle of incidence, it'll lift. If you put them at the opposite way, it don't lift no more. Um, so just going back for a moment, the whole idea of, of this is the front of the boat where, it, where it's coming up towards the waterline. Um, is curved and it's at the right angle to get lift. But at the back of the boat, it's at the wrong angle to get lift. So that's why a lot of the older boats to go fast oop, have to stick their bows in the air, whereas compared to viola, it can go far, viola and um, more modern racing dinghies like um, the development classes where hulls are allow allowed to be different, like the NS14 in Australia, the National 12 in um, the UK, um, and the Merlin Rocket in the UK in particular. They're interesting because they're, they're only body height. They don't have trapeze or hiking plank or anything. So they're sort of boats for the rest of us. Um, so they, they have a nice characteristic. So all of these boats um, would be okay until you stuck the bow in. And then the depth of the bow would mean that they would, um, that they, the bow would take over from the rudder. 
and they were actually quite slow to start planning uh, relative to the newer designs because they're just not generating any lift because most of the boat is at the wrong angle. Oops. Right. Whereas to have some flattish area, but not so wide that it pounds, um, where, where it pounds in waves, um, to have some flattish area up front. So the hulls have gone from being very V in the NS 14s in front of the mast to being a much more, I have to invert my hands, um, to having a narrow flat section. Um, up in the bow. And this is good because not only does it help generate lift and keep the bow out of trouble, I mean, the crew doesn't have to move madly back all the time and then forward again when the boat loses speed. But um, the other um, advantage of it is that the boats go through to planning speed very easily. All right. Now, I've scribbled out all these words here, um, but basically this is a dinghy, a, sailor, a, sail, a boat of any sort, um, and it's starting to um, go faster. The resistance over here, the resistance has a peak um, at what we call hull speed, which is a scaling term, but in a way it's fairly meaningless. I'm going to say it's meaningless, um, or its meaning is not clear at all. Um, that's also why I've gotten rid of all of these. You see, a, a sailing dinghy with um, a flat area at the back only and a V forward is not going to develop any meaningful lifting force at lower speeds. But if it's got the flatter sections forward and to the centerboard case um, area, um, it's as soon as it's moving, it's generating lifting force. And the lifting force increases and increases as it goes faster. So by the time, by the with the older style of dinghy, um, there's not enough lifting surface forward. Um, so you're trying to pick up speed, trying to pick up speed, trying to pick up speed and the crew has to move back, you get the stern down and the bow up, and then you've got getting lift from the lifting surfaces of an old style dinghy. Right? With the more modern dinghies, you don't need that trim to start getting the lifting force. So the boat just lifts automatically and stably, and there's no chance of dragging the transom. Um, the result of this um, is that um, the newer, well, not that new now, um, since about the middle 80s with the NS 14s, and probably not far behind that, if behind at all, with the UK National 12s and the Merlins. Um, but the boats go through what was considered a barrier, the barrier of hull speed for the older boats. They're, they're quite hard to get through and then you lose a bit of speed and suddenly the speed drops a lot because they don't, they're not happy at that point where the drag is starting to, they're not happy where the drag's starting to build up. They can slip down the slope really quickly. But the newer style of boats are already starting to lift right through this area. So the, displaced, the, the effective displacement is being reduced. Um, and they can transition through the hull speed zone um, really, really easily. Um, so semi-displacement and displacement are nonsense. If you have lifting area up towards the front of the boat, it's already starting to lift. So there's, there's some, um, so the boat is not 100% displacing. So if the boat and crew weigh 300 pounds, um, the, the lift from the flats of the bottom are starting to reduce that already. So I don't really like to use these old terms. And then I have to get rid of fully planning too, because the notion is that the boat is supported completely by the planning forces. 
which is nonsense, because if it's not displacing, it's not touching the water. It's actually not touching the water. So it's there are all these terms that we've used traditionally that are quite weak, I think, conceptually weak. Okay, so just some more NS14 photos. You can see the, the flat along that shade line there, right, along the shade lines. Um, relatively narrow sterns, so the boats don't go out of control. Um, another bunch of them. You can see the shadow line along there and there with each of the boats. Right. So, and you can also see that the rocker, the rocker of the bottom, has become much more of an even arc. Instead of piling up the curvature forward, because they need that long flat run, they actually spread it out about along the length of the boat. Um, other boats that have had trouble with them, um, oh, um, and the other advantage too is that the flat section is developing lift, which along with a little bit of rocker at the back of the boat, helps to keep the bow up and keep the bow out of trouble. And we all achieve that in different ways. Really classic cruising dinghies um, all have some rocker at the back and a relative pinched in stone compared to um, racing boats. Um, so other boats that have had trouble keeping their noses out, of, had trouble keeping their noses out, um, are the catamarans. Um, and this one is from the 1970s. This one is from the early 2000s. Um, the, with the yellow boat, you can see the depth of the bow. They've made the bow very deep to try and keep the nose out. But in the newer boats, the, the depth of the bow is very small. Part of that is rig weight, and part of that is moving the rig a bit further back. But um, a large, with boats without the elaborate um, wing masts, the elaborate and heavy wing masts, the normal sailing cats, um, had a similar problem to the dinghies. They all wanted a nice flat run. Um, also, I think a flat run favours conical development. Um, to, to have a chest on the boat and then a flat run towards the back suits the classical methods of um, uh, sheet plywood dinghy design. So if you have a look at older catamarans from the 1950s, 60s, and maybe, and going through to the 70s with a couple of exceptions, um, you find that they've got a really deep sort of chest um, and that wasn't, and all sorts of, and high bows, and they're all trying to find ways, and wide bows, to try and stop the bow from digging in. But if you look at a more modern boat, this is a, um, oh, what is it? It's a Taipan, um, an Australian design, um, designed by Boyer. Um, you can see that the rocker, the maximum rock has moved quite a long way back. And then there's kind of a little kick up at the stern, right? So the boat's almost got a kink in the bottom. And that has that kink is really important because it means the crew weight moves back a bit and the bows stay out of trouble. Also, um, with the wider transoms and often flatter hulls in space, um, same thing as the Oz Goose, that curvature of the flat area sucks the stern down so that the bow doesn't stick in. Uh, that, and that's the last slide. But these are, are things I've been quite interested in. Um, and it's one of the things has been how the information from racing dinghies um, and actual experience in alternative boats of all sorts, the sorts of boats that we mostly have, um, have actually shaped, shaped um, or allowed me to reassess my thinking. And that's something that we all do as designers. Um, we're always looking for hard data rather than opinion. Um, opinion is not enough. It has to be repeatable data. Um, so that's where racing boats come in quite useful because there's a lot of them. 
Um, so if a technique develops, it's something that um, is truly applicable. Um, so sometimes you get these circularities, um, like with the skiff classes, they're always, for years, they've had arguments about um, whether you should have a, a uh, whether you should have a um, mainsail with a lot of curve cut in the luff and have a bendy mast or have a, boat, a sail with, um, with uh, broad seaming, um, whether sail, um, sail seams are given curvature to put the depth into the sail, and a stiff mast. But, and with the skiff classes, you can see that for five or six or seven years, they say, Okay, let's have broad seams and straight masts. And then suddenly someone wins something and we find, you know, for another five or six years, it's the opposite way around. So you've got to watch out for cycles as well. Never assume that what is happening now is the um, final word. So that's it. How did I go? Not too bad. <laughs>